Hello, everyone. We are letting you in from the waiting room. Just going to give it a second to let everyone realize we're in. I see heads like lifting up. We're going to, we started recording. And then I just want to welcome you all to IEC's Lunch and Learn series. Uh, we're hoping that these sessions help keep our community connected during this difficult time, and we've made them publicly available. So this link is open, and we also put them up on our YouTube channel um, after each presentation is over, so you can watch them later. Since our, oh, I think we need to mute everyone, Jeff. I hear some back. Everyone on there? Okay. And then just a little bit about IEC. Since our founding in 1975 by a group of dedicated grassroots environmentalists, we've led issue advocacy campaigns by allowing environmental organizations to pull their resources and create a higher profile for environmental issues. Today, IEC represents more than 90 environmental and community organizations and nearly 300 individual members from throughout Illinois. I muted everyone. Okay. So if you're not already a member of IEC and these are something that you're enjoying um, and appreciating, we encourage you to become a member. And if you're able to give, you can join today using the link in the chat box um, that we'll get in there in the next few minutes. And then I think we also have some housekeeping information there in the chat box as well. Um, a few of those housekeeping items are that all attendees are muted by default. If you join via Zoom, you can use the chat function, which is in the, let me double check, right in the bottom center for me on my screen. If you're on mobile, um, I think it's in the right hand corner. Uh, you can use that to ask questions, add comments, provide resources, and time permitting, we'll do a live Q&A right at the end using that chat box. Um, right now, I'm going to invite everyone to prime the chat box and put their favorite wildflower, Illinois wildflower, in there. Um, and you can kind of see how that works. And uh, just if you're on the phone, you can use star nine to raise your hand and we can uh, unmute you to let you ask questions during that live Q&A. And then I forgot to introduce myself, but I'm Lindsay Keeney. I'm the conservation director at the Illinois Environmental Council. Oh, I'm seeing uh, the favorite wildflowers pull, pour in. We've got Dutchman's breeches, trillium, blood rot, blood root, trout lily, blazing star, all kinds of them. You guys are, you already look like experts. All right, and so I know Chris has a um, slide to introduce himself. I'm gonna unmute him. Um, but Chris is a former board member of the Illinois Environmental Council and we worked with him um, in lots of capacities, and he is involved in a lot of really cool botany type projects here in Illinois. So I'm going to turn it over to him, and I'm actually running his slides. So I'm going to share my screen and get his slides open. Terrific. Uh, thank you, Lindsay, and thanks to the Illinois Environmental Council for inviting me to present this slideshow on spring ephemeral wildflowers of course one of my favorite topics to speak about um, this beautiful scene that you see here on the um, opening slide was taken at larue pine hills uh, ecological area in union county several years ago so next slide so as lindsay mentioned uh, my name is chris benda and i've Started my career with the Illinois Natural History Survey in 2004 when I went to grad school there and uh, went out on my own. Basically, I work with and for a variety of different uh, organizations throughout Illinois and beyond. And if you're in the northern part of the state, I teach at the Morton Arboretum several times a year. And in the southern part of the state, I lead uh, nature tours with Camp Ondesoc and I teach uh, basically field botany in the summertime at Southern Illinois University. Next. Also, you can find me online as Illinois Botanizer. Uh, I have a website, IllinoisBotanizer.com, and have all the social media taken care of, mainly post on my Facebook page. Um, do a little bit on Instagram, trying to get better there. But basically, I travel to the state 
looking at plants and nature and leading tours and doing various things outdoors. And I share those experiences with people online. So give me a like on Facebook if you're into that. Um, also, next slide. Um, my website, I have a plant database set up. I've been putting the photos that I've been taking for the last 15 years of living in Illinois and sharing them uh, on the website there. And then on the bottom of each page, you can subscribe to the mailing list. Uh, I have my schedule on the website as well, but if you want to get an email reminder, I give events all throughout the state. Um, and so if you want to be connected, go ahead and give your email address there, and I'll send you periodic email reminders next. So that's enough about me. I'll go on to some introductory slides. I always like to let everybody know about George Fell. If they're unaware um, of his legacy, we really have him to thank for the preservation that is in not only in Illinois, but really the United States and even the world. He was one of the founding members of the Nature Conservancy, which is now a worldwide organization. There's a great biography of his uh, life, Force of Nature, by Arthur Melville Pearson. And it's a wonderful read. And basically, I want people to understand that when you think of names like, you know, Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir and some of these, you know, really um, uh, conservationists have left such a large mark, um, George Fell should be right there among those names. And a lot of people haven't heard of him. So I think it's important to share that uh, the work that he did. And he basically, the quote there says that what we have a chance to save, we need to save now because once it's gone, it's gone. There'll never be another chance. Next. So, of course, uh, George's work uh, creating the Illinois Nature Preserves Commission led to the INAI, which is a statewide inventory to find natural areas throughout the state. Um, unfortunately, the, the culmination of the initial um, push for, to get this project started was found that just 0.07% of the state was considered to be in a pristine natural condition. So you can see the map on the left that there are natural areas pretty well distributed throughout Illinois. 102 counties in Illinois, only two, Franklin and White, do not have a Category 1 natural area. So a lot of them are privately owned, and that's kind of unique for Illinois. And although what we have left is pretty small, um, it's priceless biological heritage that we need to protect uh, continually. Next. So you can see another representation here that shows um, basically the size of Illinois, 36 million acres, 76% of that is in agriculture. A uh, large amount is, you know, urban land, and then you can see the little red circle is the amount of high-quality natural communities uh, in 1979 that were known in the state, this 0.077%. Next. But that is why I think of this quote as also important, um, really identify with this from E.O. Wilson, that every scrap of biodiversity is priceless, never to be surrendered without a struggle. So, of course, we have our beautiful and rare Kankakee Mallow, which is unique to Illinois, um, a wildflower that has been successfully brought back from the brink of extinction. So we are doing what we can to protect our rare flora in Illinois. Next. Okay, so um, you're a captive audience. You're here because you like plants, but you can see what this meme shows. Sometimes I take a little more aggressive approach to try to sneak botany into uh, various conversation topics. So a little, little plant humor there before we head into the wildflowers next. So Illinois is a pretty diverse state, uh, about 3,600 species of plants total. You can see a number of them are beautiful flowering plants. Uh, you know, it's a fairly long state north to south, so that contributes to a lot of the diversity. Basically, the northern part of Illinois, that's the southern edge of a lot of northern adapted species. And southern Illinois is the northern edge of a lot of southern adapted species. So it's kind of the, the edge of range for, uh, provides a lot of diversity. Next. And Illinois is um, it's somewhat useful to consider the glacial history. And I'll just briefly say that there are four major areas in the state that have never been glaciated. So southern Illinois particularly is a large um, portion of land. It was uplifted about, you know, 300 million years ago. And since then, it has not been underwater and it has not been covered in glacial ice. So 300 million years is a long time to have um, basically plants and animals moving around and not affected by, you know, being underwater or, or having ice come in. So that has profound implications for the vegetation found in these places. Uh, next. And then Illinois is divided into 14 natural divisions that are further divided into sections. And these are basically, you know, different major landform types um, throughout the state. Next. 
So there are lots of places to go uh, in Illinois, but I did co-author with Chris, Chris Evans. I'm sure many of you know him. Um, when we were with the Illinois Native, Native Plant Society, we co-authored these two spring wildflower hikes in southern Illinois. And in this case, we're talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, Carbondale, south of Carbondale. So it is the southernmost portion of Illinois. Um, and each wildflower guide has seven uh, sites featured in it with a number of common wildflowers for the spring and summer. And those can be uh, downloaded uh, from the Illinois Native Plant Society website. Those are useful resources. I'd love to make some for other parts of the state um, and someday hope I will have a chance to do that. But also in the southern portion of uh, Illinois, I created this spring flora for the southern region. It's um, four pages and it has most of the conspicuous uh, you know, spring flowering plants. So those are useful resources. Of course, a lot of these occur uh, throughout the state. This is designed for south of uh, Illinois Route 64, but these are housed at the Field Museum um, with their other rapid uh, color guides, and there is one for the Chicago region for spring flora as well. Next. Let's see the four pages and go on to the next slide. Page two next. All right, and then some other useful books that you might want to consider for wildflower identification. Of course, there's Don Kurz's book that has uh, Illinois wildflowers on it. Um, can we go back a couple slides? And then uh, there's yes, also. Sorry, Chris. Um, no I've problem. got a little lag, uh, but I've, I've got you on the books now. <laughs> Okay, uh, Newcomb's Wildflower Guide is what I learned wildflowers with when I moved to Illinois. I really like that book as well. It's, it uh, doesn't have everything in the state, but it has a lot of things. Um, and then down here in the southern part of the state where I live, this Wildflowers of Tennessee and the Ohio Valley Southern Appalachians is also really comprehensive, beautiful pictures, and, and really a well-done book by the uh, Tennessee Native Plant Society. Next. So if you of course, want to graduate to the technical scientific manuals. We have two options in Illinois. Um, of course, the the tome for the state is uh, Dr. Molenbrock's Vascular Flora of Illinois. It has all 3,600 species listed in it. Uh, and then in the Chicago region, we have this amazing work of science recently published uh, by Jerry Wilhelm and Laura Rarica, The Flora of Chicago Region. So these, of course, are technical books that are somewhat um, difficult to use for lay people, but they have all the species known in the state or their region listed in them. So they are valuable resources um, in that respect. Okay, so let's talk about spring ephemerals. This introductory slide here basically is here for me to explain that um, plants need light to grow, huh? Newsflash there, huh? So a lot of plants, if they're growing in the forest, a very dense forest, there's not a lot of light that reaches the forest floor in the summertime when the leaves are fully emerged. So a lot of the rich spring ephemeral plants, they grow in mesic areas. Mesic is basically in between wet and dry. I think of it as meaning moist. And these mesic areas are rich, rich soils. They have a lot of decaying organic matter, a lot of nutrients. And so they grow a lot of plants and they grow a full canopy of trees. And so these plants need to grow, leaf out, flower, reproduce, photosynthesize, and finish their, their uh, life cycle basically before the leaves come out. Uh, on the canopy because they won't there won't be any light so they have the strategy of blooming early photosynthesizing storing that sugar in their roots you know year after year so they're very long-lived perennial plant um, these rich spring ephemeral wildflowers and this photo i took at giant city state park so i'm going to go through a number of spring wildflowers and for the most part they're arranged in chronological order so i'll introduce these plants to you tell you a little bit about them so let's go ahead and start the next slide. The first earliest blooming plant really in the state is uh, skunk cabbage. Now, unfortunately, we don't get this beauty this far south where I'm at, but typically every year I spend a little time uh, up north and try to make an effort to photograph these, usually in February. And, of course, skunk cabbage is uh, a thermogenic plant. It actually has an ability to produce heat and melt the snow around it because it blooms so early and allows the, the flowers to come up and bloom. And you see they have really interesting looking flower structure. They are in the arum family. And the arum is a group that has a spathe and spadix, is the particular uh, floral characteristics for this family. And so you see the spade is kind of the, the sheath around the spadix is in the middle there. And you can see 
all the little uh, flowers that are on that. And of course, skunk cabbage, a lot of the maroon plants do emit a foul odor, and that is to attract carrion feeders. They're pollinated by flies and beetles and things attracted to rotting flesh. And so they often have a color and a, an odor that reflects that, and it brings in these uh, early carrion feeders that are flying around. Next. Also, early flowering plant. What's up next here? Uh, the Harbinger of Spring, of course, aptly named. You can see my car key there. You, you really can't appreciate how small these are until you see them for the first time, and they are very dainty. Um, it is in the carrot family. This is the poster child for the Illinois Native Plant Society. Our journal is called Irigenia. Our newsletter is called The Harbinger. Um, and there, this plant is also sometimes called salt and pepper. You see the white petals and the purple stamens there on this little plant. It is really a special one to see. And this year was blooming as early as February 3rd uh, in Jackson County. So really early bloomer. Next. And some other really early bloomers uh, include little little lag, so bear with us. Um, spring beauty. And the interesting thing about spring beauty is it's a, one of the first wildflowers to bloom in the spring, and it's one of the last ones to finish blooming. I mean, this flower can bloom for two months in some periods uh, or some parts of Illinois. You see, they barely have anything for leaves. They're little grass-like linear leaves, and they have, um, you know, five uh, petals on them, and there is really a beautiful flower. Often they're quite white. Sometimes they're very pink and streaked with pink or, or even uh, pink petals. And what's going on there is uh, there was a study that was looking into the colors in Spring Beauty, and they found that the ones that had the pink streaking in them attracted pollinators better, and so they had more seed set, but they were also depredated. They were being have herbivory damage. So they found that the ones that were white had a chemical that you know, produced the white color that actually made them resistant to herbivory. So there's sort of, you know, different strategies um, being utilized by these plants. You, you would think, oh, well, the ones that are being pollinated would be the ones that would persist, but they're also being heavily eaten. So the ones that aren't being eaten don't put as many seed, but then they survive. So those are the, the reasons why you see the variation in color on spring beauty. Uh, next, please. Another early blooming one is bloodroot, and people mentioned some people mentioned their favorites. Um, they this is really a remarkable wildflower, and it seems that the flowers they only bloom for a day or a couple days. They 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 sprout really quickly and bloom, and then and then they're done. And so you can often find big patches of bloodroot, but you have to go out quick to find them. And they have a unique shaped leaf. Uh, they have a, a sap in the stem that's uh, like a deep orange, and I sort of get that blood root name, sanguinaria, alludes to that blood name. And it, this dye was used for dyeing fabric or um, war paint and various uses, so it's kind of an interesting plant. And then next slide, also cool about this plant is the seed dispersal mechanism. So these are actually dispersed by ants. They're covered in eliosomes, which are fatty tissue that I jokingly call ant bacon. Okay, so you can see there's a little white mohawk or a little helmet on each seed, and that is very nutrient-rich fatty tissue that ants like to consume. And so you can see there's a capsule. They'll, they'll open when they're ripe, and ants will actually carry these seeds uh, to their, their den, their, their, their home, and they'll consume the fatty tissue, and then the seed is too hard for them to eat, and they'll dispose of that, you know, in their, uh, their waste area. And that's how these seeds are dispersed, by these ants carrying them around. And, of course, we have a very fancy term to describe that listed there, and it's pronounced myrmecockery. Okay, myrmecockery is ant, it's a seed dispersal by ants. Uh, Dutchman's breeches do, does this, so does um, trout lily and some other plants as well. Next. So really neat uh, dispersal strategy there for blood root. So another early flowering wildflower is liverleaf sometimes just called hepatica, which is the genus. So um, this is very early flowering. I think down here it was two weeks ago we saw these, and on Facebook I've been seeing reports of northern Illinois now have liver leaf uh, blooming. But what, what's interesting is I tend to travel a lot of the same places every year, and I think of these wildflowers as like I think of my friends. I want to stop in and visit them and see how they're doing. And this 
particular plant I see every year when I lead tours through the Garden of the Gods wilderness area. And it grows on a boulder in a creek near the trail in the heart of the wilderness. And, and every year I make sure to stop by, see my friend. And uh, so far, so good. And what's interesting, too, is that the this wildflower is, I think, most commonly more white, sometimes pink, but most rarely a blue or even a deep purple color. So it's, it's interesting they have such variation. And, of course, I find the, the blue color to be the richest example. And a little botany tidbit here. A lot of things um, in the ranunculaceae have sepals, but no petals. So what we're actually seeing here are sepals. Then there are there are no petals present. So a little bit of the anatomy of the flower uh, next. And also when you know these bloom really quickly, but the the leaves are persistent for a while. And you can see in the photo that they're often quite variegated or mottled, and they're beautiful. And you can see it's got three lobes, and they turn brown like the color of your liver. So there's kind of reasons why it has that common name. So uh, even the leaves later in the year are also quite beautiful for liver leaves. Next. I took that picture at uh, Franklin Creek State Natural Area in Lee County. All right. Next wildflower here. Okay, so the Garden Vervain. This is an interesting one for me as well. I, this is the only place where I've ever seen this one in the wild. It, as the name implies, Garden Vervain, it is easy to obtain and put in wildflower gardens. It's got this you know, beautiful purple flower. But for years, I'd hiked the LaRue Snake Road, and early in the year, I said, what are those purple flowering plants up there? And I thought, I bet that is Garden Vervain, and I'd never seen it. So one year, I made the trek up the steep talus slope all the way up to the top to see uh, the Garden Vervain blooming. I believe this was on um, April 1st of 2016. So they're really early, but worth the effort to get to next. So also beautiful up close, and we'll go on to the next one as well. Okay, so now we're on a marsh marigold. This is also in the northern half, northern four-fifths or so of, of Illinois, so we don't have it this far south where I'm at, but it is a stunner blooming early. It likes calcareous seeps. Calcareous means, you know, it's rich in calcium. It's basic on the pH scale. Uh, in fact, when I was working on the Natural Areas Inventory Project, we were looking for high-quality steep springs, and they're very small, and they're often privately owned, so they, they're, they're hard to detect. And one of the ways that we would find them is to go with a, a, an airplane, uh, you know, a small airplane uh, early in the year, and you can fly over Illinois, and you can see these bursts of gold and yellow on the landscape. And then you have a pretty good idea that there's a high-quality fen there. There's a lot of this plant blooming, blooming in that location. So this is always a favorite to see. Every year there's always crystal clear, cold, running water um, in the habitat for this plant. Next. I actually took that picture in Wisconsin, but there are uh, lots of places to see that in Illinois. And of course, Dutchman's Breaches is a very common one that a lot of people are familiar with. You can see the little Dutchman's pants hanging out on the laundry to dry. I like to joke and say there's a lot of naked Dutchman running around the woods this time of year. I don't know, maybe they have a spare pair of breeches, but that's where it gets the name. And just like the hepatica, um, very quick blooming plants, but the leaves are quite delicate and, uh, you know, they're pretty in their own right. So the next one here is going to show a similar species, very similar to Dutchman's breeches, that's called squirrel corn. The squirrel corn is a little bit different shape to the flowers, um, but the leaves are virtually identical. And I've seen, you know, people talk about differences that they, they, they think exist. Um, with the leaves. Unless you really see them side by side, I think they're just really hard to tell apart. But one of the things with spring ephemeral wildflowers is that their whole strategy is to grow and bloom quickly. So typically, if there are leaves available for this plant, there should be flowers or should be flowers soon or even nearby. So typically, you can identify them um, just by finding the flowers that are available next. So those are both uh, related, of course, similar to the, the garden plant, the, the bleeding hearts uh, that are related to these as well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Cory Dallas is another early bloomer related to the previous ones as well. Of course, these flowers are totally different. 
on the left, we have Cordalis or Corydalis flavula, and uh, that's a little more common, smaller flowers. And then on the right, we have Micrantha, Corydalis Micrantha. And they, these are larger flowers. They're deeper yellow. It's a larger plant all around. I don't see that one as much, um, but those are two uh, similar plants, sometimes called fumewort, formerly in the poppy family, and some have it now in the fumatory family. Next. So those are really neat ones to find pretty much throughout the woods, and we have some here in the property where I live. Uh, also, toothwort is another early bloomer, pretty common. Uh, formerly, Denteria laciniata, and I really liked that name. Denteria means tooth, laciniata means cut leaves, and this plant is called cut leaf toothwort. But, you know, they, uh, those taxonomists, they can't leave anything alone. We call it the Taxonomist Continual Employment Act, where they are constantly changing things, you know, to, to – uh, to uh, basically further our scientific understanding, making a little joke there with their work. But they've placed this now in the genus Cardamony, and it really does look like uh, Cardamony as well. It's unfortunate it had such an appropriate scientific name before, but it does make sense to place this in with the Cardamony next, of which there are some other species in Illinois uh, coming up here. So we have the Bulbous uh, Springcress, Cardamony bulbosa, and then the, the glassy eye is up in the north part only, and uh, it's got a little more of a purplish tinge. They call it purple crest, but they are quite similar uh, mustard species that bloom in Illinois. Next. Of course, lots and lots of different things in the mustard family, lots of little flowers as well, but these are some of the more conspicuous examples. Uh, moving on to some other wildflowers, we have the true rue anemone. I was joking, say don't be an enemy of the anemone. And anemone is a, a, a name of a genus, and it is a name that a lot of plants have as well. Um, so the rue anemone ten, tends to grow, even though you may find a patch of them, they tend to grow as single stems. So they're solitary growing plants. Um, they often have more than five petals, um, and they have a little difference in the, the whorl of leaves that are present. Uh, versus the next wildflower, which is called the false rue anemone, uh, Anemion bitternatum. This one is colonial, so you'll find usually large patches of them, and they have typically um, flowers that have five petals that are white as well. And then the leaves, they're they're split into three groups twice. So biternatum, ternate is three, and bi is two. So biternatum is saying twice in groups of threes, and it's basically saying that there are leaves, there are three leaflets per leaf. And each leaflet is further divided into three sections. So that's the explanation for, for that common name next, or that scientific name. So both pretty, pretty common wildflowers you can find out there in the woods uh, this time of year. And another early bloomer is the blue cohosh. So this is, there's a lot of confusing things going on with this plant, I feel. First of all, um, not confusing is the name blue. The fruits are blue, so that's where that comes from. But cohosh refers to uh, Bugbane, and basically um, it's a toxic plant in the buttercup family. So this is bearing resemblance to that, but it's not a true cohosh. Um, and also, this is a, what we call a confused dicot. Most dicots have flower parts in fours and fives, and monocots have flower parts in threes. So if you look at this flower, you'll see there are six petals, or technically sepals. And so I call it the confused dicot. It's not quite acting uh, like most dicots normally do. Also, the name uh, Colophyllum thelictroides. Oides means similar to. So thelictroides means similar to thelictrum. And thelictrum is the meadow rue, which will come, is coming up a little later. The leaves do look like meadow rue, but it's not related at all. It's in, this is in the Berberidaceae. It's more related to Japanese bear, uh, barberry and mayapple and those sort of plants, and not actually in the buttercup family. So kind of an interesting plant there, really early bloomer. Another interesting thing about this is that out east, these flowers are almost always maroon. But in Illinois, same species, they're always yellow. So I think that's kind of a little interesting about that plant. Go, go ahead to the next uh, slide. And twin leaf, this is also a, a rare plant in Illinois, one that we've considered to start to track. Um, you can see it has these beautiful butterfly-looking, you know, leaf shape, looks like butterfly wings. 
Um, and the flowers sort of maybe look like bloodroot, but this is actually also in the Berberidaceae family. So it's related to May apple, which this, those flowers, you could see the resemblance to May apple. Um, but an interesting thing about this plant is that it blooms really early and really quickly. And even while it's blooming, it seems like we like to joke and say, if you look at it wrong, the petals will fall off because they're really delicate. Um, so this is one you have to seek out early and uh, photograph typically in early May. Go to the next slide. And oh, and named after Thomas Jefferson, Jeffersonia, the twin leaf. Now, bluebells, I took this picture at Thatcher Woods in Cook County many years ago, but of course this grows very commonly throughout the state in various floodplain um, habitats. This is in the Baraginaceae, uh, which most of those plants have petals that um, are fully opened up, sort of you can see the picture like this flat, but these are, the petals have actually fused into a tube, and that's what I call it, the bluebells. So they're kind of neat, and uh, you can see Definitely a gorgeous wildflower, quick bloomer, but a stunner as well. Go to the next slide. You can always find big patches of bluebells around the state. Now here's the meadow rue. So the, the blue cohosh has leaves that resemble the meadow rue. And there are actually several other uh, plants in Illinois that have that species name, Thelictroides. And this is what it's referring to, leaves similar to Thelictrum. This is our early meadow rue. Thelictrum dioecum, and dioecum means, it refers to it being dioecious. So you can see the picture here, the dioecious means that a plant is either male flowers or female flowers, but not both on the same plant. So on the left, we have a male plant that has male flowers. You can see the, the, the stamens, they're hanging there. And then on the right side, we have a female plant with female flowers. Those are the stigmas, the little white parts there that will capture the pollen and, of course, make seed. Next. And that is in the buttercup family. There are three species of thelictrum in Illinois. The other two bloom in the summer. Now, false mermaid weed is a really neat plant, also restricted to the northern part of the state. Um, it has this lime green color to it, and it just grows in huge patches, and it, it really uh, senesces quickly. So I took this picture in April. I think this is a Cook County Forest Preserve. Um, might be Thatcher Woods as well. Um, and it just, you know, totally covers the ground, and it has a little delicate flower. This is also actually another confused dicot. If you look at the flower, you'll see four petals and four sepals. That's an anomaly. Typically, this species has three, but it is a dicot, so it's another one of those confused dicots. And it's got the long name Flirchia proserpinacoides. Proserpinacoides means similar to proserpinaca. Proserpinaca, of course, being the mermaid weed. I mean, this being false mermaid weed. And the, a fun, kind of a ironic thing about that is those two plants don't really look like each other very much, but that's how this plant does get its name, the false mermaid weed. Next. It's a fun one to always go try and find, very dainty little plant. All right, now we have white trout lily. Took this photo at Maple Lake, Cook County Forest Preserve. So I found that in the northern part of the state, the... Uh, White trout lilies are much more common than yellow, and down in the southern part of the state, it's the other way around. Where I'm at, I know of a few places to find white ones. The yellow ones are pretty widespread. So that's kind of interesting. We do have a third species, uh, Mesochorium, and that is the prairie trout lily, and that has white flowers as well. But you can see that um, they have mottled leaves that sort of resemble a brook trout, and that's where it gets the name. Um, and this is a true lily. The lily family has been broken up into various families now, but trout lilies remain in Liliaceae. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh, and this one shows the yellow trout lily. I took this photo at Rocky Bluff uh, at uh, Crab Orchard National Wildlife Refuge. And there really is this stunning plant when you see them bloom. And, and also interesting is you'll often see just single leaf, um, single leaves coming out of the ground with no flowers. And like I mentioned earlier, it takes a lot of energy for a wildflower to bloom, for it to reproduce. And so because they have such a small window to photosynthesize, to store, make energy and to store it in their roots, sometimes it takes seven to up to 10 years for a spring wildflower to bloom from seed. They're basically growing for year after year in that very small window of growth storing up energy to until they have enough to, to reproduce and bloom. 
So often you can see just a, a hillside or a rock, often boulders, would just be covered with just a single leaf per plant, none of them blooming. And they're basically juveniles. They're, they're too young to bloom. Go on to the next slide. But always want to, And so when they do bloom, they produce two leaves. So you'll always see two leaves for blooming trout lily, just one uh, if it's immature. While ginger is also a common plant, it's got these beautiful reniform or kidney-shaped leaves. Um, Asarium canadensi. This is actually in, in the uh, Aristolochiaceae, which so it's related to plants like Dutchman's pipe. And you see the little uh, sort of, um, this is also a confused dicot. It's a three-parted flower at the base there. And the strategy here with the wild ginger is it's also um, attracting carrion feeders, flies and insects uh, that um, are attracted to rotting flesh. And so the flowers are at the base of the plant. Typically, flowers are up high above. The plant is advertising them, saying, you know, come visit me, my, my showy flowers, attracting pollinators. Well, this plant, you know, often beetles and flies and things are in the leaf litter. Um, in the springtime, this is an early bloomer. You know, there's not a lot of insects out, but insects are looking for food, so they're they're going to uh, plants like wild ginger, and they can actually go in the little sort of urn-shaped um, wildflower and seek refuge. When you have these cold spring nights, the wildflower is down in the leaf litter where it's warmer um, with the soil, and so sometimes they actually have a little home there that they can hang out in. Uh, so it's sort of a, a mutual benefit there with the wild ginger. Go to the next slide. And we'll mention that um, wild ginger not related to our culinary ginger at all. Um, they're totally different plants, different families. The golden seal, another one, um, was once overcollected, of course, because it has um, disputed medicinal properties. Um, but this actually is a species that has made a tremendous um, comeback in Illinois. In fact, it, here in the southern part of the state, it's one that is tracked by the national forest. So when I do surveys for them, I have to um, document where they occur and sometimes it gets a little tedious because it is so common there's really a lot of golden seal down here but you see when they do bloom they just have these really strange looking flowers there are no petals you can see there's a whirl of stamens and then of course you have the styles in the middle but they're all stamens and uh and like the trout lily if it's too young there will be a single leaf on a single stem it will not bloom and when they're reproductively mature they'll have two leaves and then they'll bloom there so at the the base of the, of the leaf. So go to the next slide. They're definitely uh, a beautiful plant to see early in the spring. Oh, and they produce a red fruit later in the year that is, is kind of neat to see as well. Now, may apple we have, I think most people are familiar with may apples, um, Podophyllum peltatum. When you have um, basically the stalk of the leaf and the leaf attaches straight on the top, and it doesn't go through or attach in any other way, that's called peltate. That's where we get that name. And of course, podophyllum means foot leaf. And the flowers actually bloom underneath the leaves. So the down in the axles of the, the, basically the branch of the two leaves. Because just like uh, golden seal and like trout lily, may apple is the same. Single leaf, single stem, it will not flower. It's reproductively immature. It needs to grow more. And then when they're ready, they'll branch and grow two separate leaves. They'll flower at that branching underneath the leaves, and then you know they're reproductive. They produce a, a large fruit um, that is edible when it's ripe, but all parts of this plant are poisonous otherwise. So you have to be very careful when you're dealing with this plant. But the box turtles do favor um, eating those um, fruit pods, and that's one of the ways this is dispersed. It is a clonal plant, so you do see huge patches of it. I have some right outside here where I'm at in the woods. Um, so it's a lovely one to find always. Go to the next slide. And like I mentioned earlier, in the bare baradaceae, in with twin leaf and blue, blue cohosh and barberry. Hori pacoon is not exactly a spring ephemeral wildflower, but down in stream southern Illinois where I live, it blooms very early. It blooms on limestone glades when hardly anything else is blooming. So I put it in the spring group. Uh, in the northern part of the state, of course, you can find these blooming in June, you know, near stand prairies and, and various um, savannas and things. But Little Spermum Canescens is the name. I took this picture at Simpson Barrens where there was a nice big clump of this wildflower, and it's just one of my favorites, so I had to include it. We'll go to the next slide. It's uh, related to the bluebells. It's in the Boragin ACE, the Borage family. 
and Shooting Star. So we have three Shooting Stars in the state, um, but French is Shooting Star is the first to bloom, and it only occurs in the greater Shawnee Hills, which is basically Giant City State Park, a lot of the Shawnee National Forest, Belsmith Springs, Garden of the Gods. Those are all places where you can see French's shooting star. So George Hazen French was the first botany professor at SIU, Southern Illinois University. In 1874, he discovered this species at Giant City State Park, and he was with Stephen Forbes, who uh, discovered a saxifrage species as well. So Forbes has the Forbes saxifrage named after him, and French has the French's shooting star. Formerly Dodecathion Frenchii, been reclassified now as Primula Frenchii. And this plant only grows along the drip line or underneath sandstone overhang. So only in the greater Shawnee Hills, only along sandstone bluffs. Um, the more common um, Meads shooting star grows on top of bluffs in dry open woods and prairies and throughout the state. So this one's a little bit different, and it's very special wildflower for Illinois because for a long time it was thought that it only occurred in, in Illinois, no other state, but now we know we found it in uh, several adjacent states as well. Let's go to the next slide. But it's one here I will be seeking soon to photograph here in southern Illinois. Swamp buttercup, there are, I think, 32, 29, 30, somewhere 30-ish species of ranunculus in Illinois. And there are a lot of them. They can be kind of confusing, but this one does like to keep its feet wet, like the name implies, a swamp buttercup. Uh, ranunculus means little frog, and I think that's kind of a cute name. It, it refers to the wetland habitats that a lot of these species occur in. In fact, some of them are fully aquatic, and they, they have uh, leaves underwater, so that's kind of neat as well. And septentrionalis means from the north. We'll go ahead to the next slide. Lots of Lots of different buttercups in Illinois, but all pretty similar. Now we have bellwort, two species in the state. Uvularia grandiflora is more common. That's the one on the left. And then the much uh, more uncommon is the Uvularia sessile. We see that on Uvularia grandiflora on the left that the leaves, the stems actually pass through the leaves. That's called perfoliate. So that makes them easy to identify. But the ones, um, on the right side, there are sessile leaves, meaning they attach directly to the stem. There's no stalk. It doesn't wrap around. So they're pretty, pretty easy to ID in that respect. And you can see the little paler yellow flower. We'll go to the next slide. Um, and Heron Pond, actually, is a great place to see the sessile leaf bellwort because it's, it's quite uncommon. Now here's some violets, of course. Uh, so I think the violets, we also have around 30 species in Illinois. Lots of them. I thought it would be interesting to put a couple pictures of non-violet violets there. Of course, most of the violets are violet-colored, and type of blue or purple. But we have the cream violet uh, on the left, as well as the downy yellow violet on the right. Um, and one of the things that you could look at to distinguish uh, violets is look and see if the flower stalk has leaves attached to it or if it's by itself. Some of the, um, some of the violets... A lot of them have a flowering stalk that has no leaves on it. We could say they're acolescent, no stem leaves. But then others, like the yellow uh, violet, they have leaves that are on the stems that bear the flowers as well. So that's a characteristic to look into because there are so many similar species. You can go to the next one. Oh, we even have a green violet. It's really blow your mind when you see that one. Uh, Jack in the pulpit, of course, most people know. Such a remarkable wildflower, um, Erythema trifolum. You can see, it again, this is in the arum family. So we have a spathe and spadix. Of course, the spathe is the pulpit. The spadix is jack inside, and that's where the flowers are born on that little tube. Go to the next slide. And then its cousin here is the green dragon. Also very similar flower structure, different shaped leaf. Um, but they're just a really neat one that I always enjoy finding in the woods. Go to the next slide. Just found a little bit, a little patch in my woods here the other day. I hadn't noticed before, so that was exciting. And then Jacob's ladder, it, as the name implies, it has these sort of ladder-like leaves. They're often opposite or sub-opposite, arranged in pairs, like a like rungs on a ladder. And the flowers are just this special hue of blue that I find. I just think it's a color that's not uh, commonly exhibited wild wildflowers. And the flowers are quite ephemeral, but the the leaves will persists throughout the year. You can identify this, you know, in late summer, often in certain places. We'll go to the next slide. 
it is the type genus Polymonium, so of the Polymoniaceae, the phlox family. Now we have fern leaf Phacelia. This looks like a water leaf. It has water spots on it. It is related to water leaf, but it is in the genus Phacelia. Water leaf is a uh, hydrophyllum. This is Phacelia uh, bipenatifida because it has uh, bipenatifid leaves. So kind of a neat one there. I always think of the Paul Simon song. Phacelia, you're breaking my heart whenever I see this plant. So go on to the next one. There are um, three, three other Phacelias in Illinois, but that one's more common. Here's one here, the Phacelia persei. So this is called Miami Mist. It has these beautiful little fringed petals. Not to be confused with the plant called fringed Phacelia, which you may have seen in like the Smoky Mountains and farther east. We don't have that particular species in Illinois, but this is similar in, in having those fringed petals. And this is an annual, so where it grows, there's often a lot of it. Along uh, Snake Road at La Rupine Hills, for example, I mean, it's super common. But other trails and roadsides, you can just see a lot of this wildflower. You can go to the next slide. It's really a stunner with those fringed petals. And then here is the water leaf. Our most common example, uh, where I'm at here, is Hydrophyllum appendiculatum. Go ahead and show the next slide. It shows what the appendiculatum is referring to this appendage. And if you look at the flower up close, you can see that there are five uh, sepals. And those, those are the long, you know, they're extending up the flower petal. But in between those is another little short green spur, and it's pointing towards my fingers, pointing opposite from the flower, straight down. That's the appendage. So if you see that, you know you're looking at Hydrophyllum appendiculatum um, versus some of the other Hydrophyllum species. So that's useful to know. We'll go next. You can see the little weevil, of course, hanging out on the flower there. And now phlox. Phlox is one of my favorite species. I took this photo in my yard. In my yard, I mean the woods. As my yard, nothing is planted. It's, I have woods right up to the house, so it's all natural. Um, it's a great landscape there. And one of the things I like about phlox is the common name is phlox. Scientific name is phlox. Makes it really easy. It's kind of like geranium, sassafras. Hydrangea, those are all plants where the common name is the same as the genus, and so that makes it a little more straightforward. This is Phlox divericata, which we call wild blue phlox. We'll go next. This is one of the early blooming ones, but there are several phloxes in Illinois, um, including this next one, I believe. There it is, Clef Phlox, yes. So these next few slides show what I like to call mass bloom or full glorious bloom. That was a term that Floyd Swink used. We've abbreviated to say FGB. So here's cleft flocks in FGB at the talus slopes of the Room Pine Hills. You can see the petals are um, bifid or cleft, which makes them uh, unique and different. Go to the next slide. That's a big patch of them at LaRue. Also here, LaRue Snake Road, we have dwarf larkspur. We have two larkspur species in Illinois, but the other one is the Carolinianum, is the summer bloomer and it is rare it's on our endangered species list this is restricted to the south but it is um it is a stunner when you see a huge expanse of it i mean there's just not a lot of wildflowers that have this sort of rich blue purple color to them so i find it remarkable go to the next slide and it's in the in the buttercup family delphinium tricorni and then the, here we have uh celandine poppy it's coming up next Another mass bloom here near Inspiration Point at La Rupine Hills. So this is in the poppy family. So bloodroot and celandine poppy are the only true uh, native poppies in Illinois. Um, and of course, what makes the poppy family is toxic. Uh, but this one will spread pretty well on its own. So we'll go ahead to the next slide here. It grows often in big, large patches. You see the leaves aren't even out on the trees yet. And we have, oh, wild hyacinth. So this is at Cave Creek Glade, south of Vienna, owned by the, the state. And you see an expanse of wild hyacinth at the base of the slope. We'll go to the next slide. I would love to go see those. Okay, so 1249, I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit here because I have some shrubs i got to show you. So blue-eyed marions are beautiful. That's at Giant City. We'll go to the next slide. That's, a, that's a, uh, an annual. Um, we also have wood sorrel. This, I took this picture in my driveway. 
blooms out front. It's really a beautiful little plant. Go to the next one. You can see the leaves that are all folded up and they're purple underneath. This is a little dainty flower. And then we have nine trilliums in the state. So I'm going to show you some trilliums. The first bloomer is the snow trillium. As the name implies, it can bloom through the snow. I'll go to the next slide. It is, you can't appreciate how small these are from that picture. They are really small. Um, but a larger one, as the name suggests here, white trillium, trillium grandiflorum little more common through a lot of the woodlands in the in northern, you know, two-thirds of the state. We'll go to the next slide. Um, and then another white trillium that's much larger is Trillium flexipes. See there, go to the next slide. It's a beautiful, stunning wildflower. <clears throat> and then the most common one here is probably the purple trillium, also called prairie trillium and bloody nose trillium and all these lots of, this is a plant with a hundred common names. So I just call it Trillium recurvatum. You see it's got the maroon flowers as well. Interesting thing is that Trillium recurvatum occurs in every county in Illinois, but in any other of the adjacent states around, it's, not, it's like we are definitely the heart of its range. And sometimes they can have yellow petals, like you see here, variety lutium, but still purple stamens. And we'll go to the next slide. Actually, it should say form. There's, they're not varieties. These are forms. So it should say F lutium. And then the next one here, F shayi. So the shays trillium is the one that has the yellow petals and yellow stamens. That's really the stunner and the rarest of them all. Still waiting to, to see it here on my screen. Which one are you looking for, so Chris? We, Shays? Uh, that's one right here, yes, Shays, yes, thank you. See that yellow petals and yellow stamens. So this is the rarest form of the three, really one to keep your eye on and just beautiful wildflower. Thanks, we'll go ahead. On uh, to the next one, which is the Cecil Trillium, also not as common. You can see a lot of the ones before, the, the green parts there were pointing down. That's the recurvatum, the recurved sepals. On this one, they're spreading. Go to the next one. So that makes it uh, easy to identify. And green trillium is also very rare. It only occurs in uh, Illinois and Missouri. We'll go to the next one, and you can see how the green uh, Flower parts there, point straining up. And then red trillium, also very rare in Illinois. Took this picture up at Mississippi Palisade State Park. So there's a nice nature preserve. Go to the next slide. Also purple flowers, often called ill-scented trillium. And this little weird one is one that I found in the woods here nearby, and it's blooming. It's not known from the state. I'm a little confused of what to think about it, but um, there is a little patch here that I'm going to go check out this afternoon, photograph. So. Follow me on Facebook, I'll post a photo. Uh, but there you have Trillium staminium. It's more common to the south of Illinois. We'll move on to the next slide. So quite rare there. I think that's the last of the trilliums. So just you can just click through quickly till we get to the shrubs. You got wild columbine here, um, beautiful wildflower. My wife there posing with them. And next, Bishop's cap. Doll's eyes. Oh, and they'll stop here. Yellow lady slippers. These are one of my favorites, and they will be blooming at the end of April. I found a number of new populations last year uh, in the summertime when they weren't blooming, so I'm excited to go back and see them bloom. But they are just, I mean, they'll make your heart stop. They are so beautiful. Uh, so this is the last uh, forb. I'm going to go now through some shrubs quickly, but I want to leave time for questions. So we'll whiz through the shrubs here. We'll just kind of list them off here. I think we start with Red bud. Let's see what's up next here. The red buds are blooming right now where I'm at in profusion, just an absolutely gorgeous color. Continue. You can see the flowers up close. Um, really beautiful <clears throat> shrub, very common tree in Illinois. And then we have service berry, also early bloomer. Can't tell you the stories, I'm out of time. We'll, we'll, we'll do that another day, but continue on here. Um, a lot of neat names for that particular shrub. Red buckeye, and then next is its cousin, the Ohio buckeye. So red flowers on the red buckeye, cream yellow flowers on the Ohio buckeye. And then, oh, the viburnum is the rusty black haw. These, I took this picture, these grow right in front of my house, and they're getting ready to bloom. And they're so gorgeous, and they smell wonderful, but they bloom really quickly. Uh, then bladder nut, it's another spring shrub flowering got you can see the little bell-shaped flowers they form a little lantern capsule like thing so they're neat and then got just two pictures left here so we'll pause here for a second on silver bells 
uh, Halesia tetractora, and this only grows in Pulaski and Massac County along the Ohio River. Uh, it's an endangered shrub in Illinois, but it is one that I'm seeing in the nursery trade, and so you can get your hands on it. It's got these beautiful white bell-shaped flowers, and they make a lot of them. So go on to the next slide. The last uh, shrub then I'll show you is the wild azalea. And also like the lady slipper orchids, these are just stunningly beautiful, and I always try to go find them every year. Uh, Trail of Tears State Forest, uh, LaRue Pine Hills, you can see these if you know where to look, and they are stunningly beautiful. So that gives us uh, five minutes left here. We'll go to the final slide. Uh, you can contact me by email. Uh, check out my website as well. I'd be happy to answer any questions at any time, uh, including uh, right now. So thanks for attending. I hope you learned a lot, and uh, we'll see if there are any questions. Yeah, I'm going to pull up in the chat. Um, and I want to thank everyone for bearing with us. We are uh, presenting across the very long state of Illinois. So any lag was because Chris is way down in Southern Illinois and I'm up here. Um, but like you said, we're gonna do some questions really quick. Um, if you wanna throw those questions in the slide or in the chat box, I will open um, them up to Chris and I'll just read them aloud to you, Chris, if you're ready for some quick fire questions. Sounds good, sure. Okay. Um, lots of people are asking about if these slides will be available afterwards. Jen let some people know that we'll have them on our um, YouTube where we li link to Chris's website. Here we go. Are the petals of spring beauty always so pointed? Are the what of spring beauty? The petals. What part? Petals. The pe um, gosh, I'm not sure to answer that question. I hadn't noticed they were so pointy. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll, that's an observation I'm going to have to continue to make. Let's see. And then someone else said May apples equal morel time. Yes, yes, very much. <laughs> so I, 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 I joke with people and say that I only see green. I think I've found three morels in my entire life, but I'm not <laughs> a very fun guy. Um, someone asked, can you purchase most of these wildflowers? Are there any good places? Some of them you can purchase, like bluebells are easy to obtain. Uh, I have a lot of people who, who have put bluebells in their property. Um, same with the Celandine poppy. I, I bought some at our native plant sale for my neighbor and they're expanding and, and uh, they bloom every year. Um, other ones a little harder to obtain. Um, shooting stars I've seen, but shooting stars take a long time to grow from seed. So you have to grow them for a long time. But often people are, you know, if they're buying plants, they want them to be kind of showy, and that's one where you kind of have to wait a while. Um, so I would say a good number of these are available um, in the, 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 the trade, but a lot of them are hard to obtain seed for. Um, and of course, you wouldn't want to dig up plants or anything. So some of them just need to be viewed uh, in their native habitat. Great. Peggy wants to know, does water leaf always bloom? I often see the leaves without bloom. So yeah, water leaf, it does grow in large patches. And so like the other spring ephemerals, um, if they're reproductively immature, they will not bloom. Um, but they also, uh, they persist in other times of the year. So outside of springtime, I often see large patches of leaves. So those of course maybe have been done blooming. There actually is one species, um, the Canada water leaf, I believe, that the flowers actually are below the leaves. The leaves are higher than the flowers, so they may be hard to see in that respect. Um, so there's a few answers there, basically, yes, and but there are some other things going on as well. And I'm gonna butcher plant names on accident, but someone is, uh, Adrian says that they're very happy to know the difference between juvenile and adult erythronium and hydrastis canadensis. Um, they had always wondered how to tell if they were in that. Um, someone says yeah, there was a squirrel leaf. flower. Yeah, someone says that there was a squirrel flower that was skipped over tubular shape that looked really cool. Squirrel corn was one in there. May, may have skipped over quickly, but yeah, that was a neat one. Yeah, I see Peggy, she's shaking her head. That That's must it. be it. Um, oh, okay. And then, then Charmaine says, which ferns in Illinois would you recommend visiting to observe? Oh. 
they're wondering where to observe wildflowers. Maybe which park? For, for wildflowers? Parks? Is that the question? Yeah. Yeah, where, where would you recommend visiting to observe wildflowers in Illinois? So, well, for wildflowers, there's, you know, obviously lots of places. If you were, if you were talking spring ephemeral wildflowers, you want to find these uh, mesic woodlands. Um, so there's a number of Cook County forest reserves or any of the, you know, forest reserves uh, in the Chicago region. Allerton Park is a great spot. Lodge Park, if you're sort of in the middle of the state. Um, Carpenter Park in Springfield is a, is a wonderful spot for spring wildflowers. Of course, down south, we have Giant City, Fern Cliff, LaRue Pine Hills. Uh, Trail of Tears State Forest. So there, there are a good number around. I would look for Illinois Nature Preserves and ones that have um, mesic woodlands contained within them. So maybe like a, a ravine or a stream corridor. Um, and that's, that's a good place to look for these wildflowers. Uh, messenger everyone's Woods, exactly. I see me. that coming up. Pilcher Park. Yeah, yep. everyone's, everyone's correcting me. Not Deer just parks. Grove. They're asking about fens, F-E-N-S, one of the main types of wetlands. Ah. Yes, a fen is a glacial wetland, basically, and um, I led a fen tour for the Morton Arboretum a couple years back where we visited several examples, um, but basically groundwater is going into the ground and then it'll hit an impermeous surface and then it'll come out sideways and come up you know, above the ground, so it's, it's permanently saturated, permanent flow of cold, calcium-rich, you know, high uh, basic pH um, uh, in in the water that basically certain plants uh, will grow in. So they kind of look like a, sort of like a quicksand uh, sort of area, like Bluff, Bluff Spring Fen has some nice fens, Lake in the Hills Fen, of course. Um, and a seep and a fen, sometimes they're kind of similar. They are separate communities, um, but that's basically the, the gist of, uh, of our fen communities. Great. Thanks, Chris. Well, I think we are, okay. we're a little bit over time, one or two minutes, but we appreciate you giving this. This is fantastic. Those pictures are beautiful. I'm getting a lot. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, in the chat, people are really enjoyed this. So I see a lot of hands clapping with okay. people, people know how to work Zoom better than we Thank do. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Chris. Bye, everyone.